The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar series. Great to have you on board tonight. My name is Peter Havoant, and I work with the webinar coordinators, Aggregate Consulting. Tonight, we'll have uh, Dr. Colin Trengove from the University of Adelaide, and uh, we're looking Following up from his previous session on use, we're going to look at the importance of trace minerals for land growth. Now, before we get into our intro and I hand over to Colin, we'll just quickly go through uh, the usual rundown, which will uh, I'll explain to you how to work through the webinar platform we're using. So the most important button is, is that orange control button, that'll allow you to hide your screen and be able to see Colin's presentation clearly. The other point that I will um, uh, highlight to you guys is you, the ability to ask questions throughout the, um, throughout the webinar and at the end. So uh, yeah, take, take the time to, to put your questions out there and we'll collate them and, and get them answered for you at the end of the session. All right, so uh, you have, if you have any difficulties, you can also message me or put a question through to me and I can assist you there. So just before we, I hand over to Colin, I'll give you a little quick rundown on Colin's background. So uh, as well as being a consultant, Colin is a lecturer of ruminant health and production at the University of Adelaide. Uh, as I mentioned, he's got a consulting business uh, where he facilitates lifetime new management groups for MLA and seminars on various livestock areas. So uh, no surprise, he's, he's got a keen interest in ruminant nutrition and you know a, a history of working with government, academia and mixed veterinary practice. Outside of, of teaching and consulting, uh, he's doing a few research projects pr at present, looking at macro and trace minerals for both steers and lambs. So I think uh, that'll be enough for uh, me in the intro. I'll just flag with you all the next webinar coming up will be resolving conflict with Neville Brady. Please also remember if you need to exit early um, or at the end of question time to uh, submit some feedback. It's a quick two minute, um, two minute survey and you'll be able to um, again, you know, steer where this event goes to in the future. So that's enough from me, Colin. I'll hand over to you now. Bear with me. You should see the invite there now, Colin. Okay. That's uh, showing up okay? Yep, I can see your screen. Sound good. Thanks, Colin. Rightio. Thank you very much, Peter for the intro and uh, and welcome everyone who's on online. Uh, and so I'm pleased to uh, have the opportunity to present this on behalf of MLA, uh, my main employer, which is the University of Adelaide, but also my um, long-term cons consulting business. Uh, so I gave the presentation there about a month ago on the importance of trace elements for the, the, leg, the pregnant you. So it'll be a bit of overlap, of course, with what I'm presenting tonight about the importance for lamb growth. But hopefully there's sufficient difference for anyone who uh, attended the last one that um, I won't, uh, won't bore you with the detail. Okay, so um, I did present this at the last mention, uh, the last uh, webinar, that the reasons for poor growth in young livestock, as uh, quoted by Neville Suttle, um, a livestock nutritionist in New Zealand. So in order of probability, the, um, the most common reason for poor growth in young livestock is insufficient dietary energy or protein. Uh, either of those, obviously, the major components of, um, of the diet, uh, followed by maternal undernutrition, so not in, in frequently the, um, the ewe uh, may have been undernourished and so, or malnourished, in other words, either not getting enough energy and or protein or not getting the right mineral balance, uh, resulting in in poor milk production, or or more so prior to um, parturition or prior to lambing, that um, uh, 
the uh, lamb hasn't grown well enough because of the uh, undernutritional malnutrition and then that can carry over into lactation with reduced uh, milk production and so the lamb grows at a slower growth rate and as a result of that is uh, more prone to disease or or death through various other reasons. Uh, so the next most important is uh, infectious or parasitic disease in, in young lambs, especially those that didn't perhaps get a, a full dose of colostrum or have subsequently had uh, suboptimal milk intake. Environmental stresses, certainly the biggest cause of uh, lamb loss at birth, but can also be a, an issue in those, that early um, postnatal period. So all the environmental stresses listed there. Poor genetics, of course. As we know, where genetics can play a major role in, in growth rate uh, and in general disease um, protection. Then we have, uh, then we get down to the uh, mineral level. So insufficient dietary intake of one or, or more minerals, and that can be both macro or trace elements. So that said, I'll move now on to a bit more about um, mineral nutrition. Uh, and so another uh, repeat from the last session. So factors determining mineral availability. I'd like to put this in here just for completeness to highlight the fact that um, mineral intake in livestock, uh, there's so many factors that influence it, that it's uh, that every every farm is a, its own case study, and for that matter, just about every paddock is its own case study. So when we talk about um, you know reduced performance, uh, uh, immuno incompetence, or you know reduced disease resistance, uh, poor growth rate. Um, it can be a, a number of factors which may be just playing a role in a particular paddock or in a particular mob or a particular flock. And uh, so you can do um, a whole lot of different studies, uh, case control where you've got treated and untreated, but it's really only applicable to the paddock or the property on which you're doing the trial. And so it doesn't necessarily extrapolate to the neighbouring uh, paddock or, or properties. Uh, so that said, I mean, soil type is a, a major influence on mineral availability. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting parts there is that often during the uh, summer autumn period, when feed is quite dry, friable, um, and often lacking in mineral content, uh, as the animals tend to graze, graze close to the ground, they are eating a fair bit of soil. And as a result of that, they're actually getting quite a bit of mineral intake. So even though uh, commonly people put out blocks and licks during the summer autumn period um, to supplement minerals, it's actually not the period where minerals are usually most lacking. It tends to be after the autumn break when the uh, short green feed, uh, which tends to be very mineral deficient uh, and playing a major role in the diet that we see the problems evolving. So fertilizer history uh, certainly can have a significant influence on mineral intake, perhaps more so the uh, macro elements rather than the trace elements, but uh, both are relevant. The um, climate certainly plays a major role and we tend to see more trace element deficiencies in the good years. So uh, perhaps all those parts of New South Wales, Queensland that have been getting all the rain lately, they may be um, certainly more susceptible to trace element and for that matter macro element deficiencies in the in the coming months. Whereas uh, good old uh, south uh, southwest and, uh, and southern Australia, where we are still waiting for a bit of a decent rain, um, Race element deficiency is not going to be a, a, a relevant issue at this point of time. Uh, the stage of plant growth, as I said, it's the um, early uh, growth after the season break that tends to be mineral deficient, and that extends through until those plants have got a, a well-developed root system. So we're talking in the late winter spring period. The availability, so the, the form in which the mineral was presented, whether it's the organic form from the soil or whether it's a, an inorganic form that we may dose them with, and uh, the availability can vary enormously. And lastly, they're the plant species. So generally grasses are more mineral deficient than your legumes, uh, with the odd exception where, uh, for example, selenium is more available in grass than legumes, but to most of the other minerals are more available in legumes. Uh, and then you have some species that actually accumulate minerals. So we can do um, effectively a a pasture analysis or go around and sample the pasture that's on offer in the paddock. We can never accurately predict what the animals are eating because they always seem to be able to foster and find uh, clover burr or, or some grains uh, and some other uh, small perennials or whatever that we may not sample when we're doing a, a plant tissue test. But effectively, we know what the minimal requirements are for um, uh, good performance in sheep and cattle. So whether we're talking the macro or trace elements, uh, but uh, that's that's an oversimplification of really what they um, 
of their trace element and macro element stateless because we know that all these minerals tend to interact and the excess of any one can re reduce say deficiency in another. Uh, and so if we look at a, a diagram uh, like here, the mineral interrelationships, and this is by no means a complete illustration, but just highlighting that um, any one of these minerals in excess, uh, the arrow pointing away uh, indicates that it can have a depressive effect on the other minerals. And where you've got both arrows pointing in both directions, it means um, that uh, they can have a depressive impact on each other. So for example, if we looked at um, magnesium here, um, an excess of magnesium will have an impact on phosphorus, but an excess of phosphorus will have an impact on magnesium, for example. Uh, and, and some of these minerals like iron, for example, can have multiple interactions with phosphorus, with cobalt, with copper, and so forth. And so really, um, middle rate relationships make it so complex that um, that's why I say that every, every mob and every paddock uh, tends to be its own case study in terms of what mineral deficiencies may show up. So I'm going to restrict this uh, presentation really just to the, the key three, I suppose, the cobalt, selenium and copper. Uh, otherwise we could be here all night talking about the other interactions and, uh, and the impact of the uh, mi minerals either in excess or deficiency. I might add here that most minerals, um, uh, you can provide plenty without issue, but um, selenium and copper are two exceptions in that if you provide an excess of those, you can actually cause toxicity and so, uh, and death in, in ruminants, be it cattle or sheep, or go to our packers or, or whatever. So um, some of these minerals uh, provided in excess can create problems. Just briefly touching on bioavailability. So we see here, so for example, um, in a milk-fed lamb, 70 to 85% of the copper that's in the diet, you know, effectively in the milk, uh, is available to the lamb. Whereas uh, if we're looking at uh, copper availability at pasture, or for the matter in grain, um, less than one up to 10% is actually available to the animal. And one of the problems with copper is there's a lot of other mineral interactions. So an excess of molybdenum, sulfur, iron, zinc, manganese, cadmium, can all impact the available copper. So you may actually have enough copper in the diet, but these interactions make it unavailable, turn it into an insoluble complex, which passes out of the dung. Manganese, for example, less than 1% is actually uh, available from the diet, uh, but that's often enough to meet their needs. But if you've got an excess of iron or calcium or phosphorus, uh, that can render that unavailable. And so it goes on that um, zinc, selenium, cobalt here, we see that um, there's variable amounts available depending on the, on the form it is. Uh, sometimes we provide these trace elements as a, a chelate, which generally has a higher bioavailability than as uh, the sulfate form, which is the cheapest form available. Uh, so they tend to have a, a lower bioavailability in the sulfate form. That's why it's cheap, whereas the um, chelates uh, tend to be more expensive, but they are also uh, more available. So what is the evidence of a mineral deficiency? So we talk about mineral status declining from the um, uh, early winter period. So after the autumn break, uh, we tend to see that um, because animals are grazing short grain feed, and the first six weeks of that uh, short grain feed is really relying on the mineral reserves in the seed. Uh, and as the uh, plant develops a better root system, it then starts to take up some of the nutrient from the uh, soil. Uh, and generally it takes up whatever is most available. And that's usually, uh, depending on once again, on the fertilizer history, it's going to be most likely uh, phosphorus and perhaps sulfur and perhaps nitrogen. And if it's a reasonable clay soil, there's probably gonna be a lot of potash there. But um, some of the other macro elements like uh, calcium and magnesium are much less um, available. And so they take a, a lot longer to be absorbed. And your trace elements are generally less available with the exception of some things like molybdenum, which um, is readily taken up. Uh, and so we can see um, already a problem with uh, reduced immunity in the, in the livestock followed by a reduction in growth rate and fertility. Um, and these can be well established well before we actually see any clinical signs of uh, poor performance in the animal. So um, it can be late winter, um, in certainly in the Southern Australian environment, where we will actually see clinical signs of, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, of evidence of, of disease, whereas you can already have um, a reduced immunity, uh, growth and fertility, um, affecting you know, a proportion of the mob. 
Uh, and the same principle applies in, in cropping for that matter too, that we generally say that you have a 20% deficiency in particular nutrients before you'll actually visually pick it up. That's why we tend to do plant tissue analysis uh, because you can actually uh, detect it um, at the biochemical level uh, long before you'll actually see it visually. So the stages of mineral deficiency. Uh, so early after the autumn break, um, we may start to get a depletion of uh, particular minerals in the diet. Uh, and this, if we do a liver biopsy, for example, at the stage, we can see that the liver copper levels are depleted, or we may see the uh, cobalt or selenium liver levels depleted. Uh, and it may or may not be apparent in the, um, in the blood or the, or the serum. Uh, then as the uh, deficiency progresses through that sort of midwinter period, the evidence of a deficiency may become more apparent in the uh, blood samples be it serum or plasma. Uh, and then as time progresses further on, uh, we start to see the dysfunction, which may be um, at the enzyme level. So we'll get um, evidence of uh, dysfunction, uh, shortage of the mineral resulting in enzyme deficiencies, which then starts to impair, or the disorders then show up, such as um, you know, loss of wool strength or loss of crimp, uh, reduced growth rate, wool growth rate, uh, loss of appetite, uh, increasing muscle disease in the case of uh, selenium or white, white muscle disease as we call it. So there's a progression that um, if we're doing uh, liver biopsies, you may pick up these deficiencies long before they present as a clinical sign. Whereas um, sometimes with the blood samples, the, uh, by the time the um, liver reserves are depleted, uh, at, the, at a later stage, the blood levels become depleted and uh, we may already have clinical signs before the blood sample will, will show it up. So when does deficiency occur? So normally if we're looking at um, that active green growth following the autumn break, where we've got a high crude protein and a high digestibility or a high metabolizable energy, uh, that's when depletion generally begins because of that poor root development in the new uh, green growth. And if we're having a particularly good season, we get a flush of green feed. Uh, and so that actually tends to dilute the amount of nutrient uh, per gram of uh, plant tissue. And so that's why we tend to see more deficiencies in your better years. Whereas in your perhaps uh, low rainfall years, uh, there's more concentrated nutrient in because there's less plant material available. Then as we progress through into the midwinter period, uh, the, um, without supplementation, these animals are likely to show deficiency if it's a deficient soil type or, uh, or soil or plant type. And the uh, dysfunctions may become evident, but then as the plant further progresses through the year into that flowering stage uh, and the uh, haying off period, we then find that the, because the plants have developed a really well-developed root system, the, um, there's a lot more nutrient available to the plant and uh, generally the um, obviously available to the animal. And so deficiencies tend to resolve as we get into that spring period. Now that's uh, an overgeneralization. Some minerals are, and vitamins are certainly more, more uh, lacking in the uh, summer period. But in terms of copper and cobalt in particular, that's the pattern that follows uh, and can be with selenium, although selenium can be deficient any time during the year. So if we do a plant tissue analysis uh, sequentially through the year, perhaps taking samples monthly in the same paddock in the same, same area, we see here that the uh, trace elements, depending on which one we're talking about as to um, how much is available, but generally tracks along at a relatively low area, low level until you get to that late winter period when there's a better root system, the soil's warming up, more minerals available to the plant through more micro uh, biological activity. Uh, and so we tend to see a jump in the, uh, mineral levels, be it macro or trace elements. And even these uh, trace elements required in very low amounts like cobalt and selenium, they will also jump in that period as well. So when do trace element deficiencies occur? As I said, copper, cobalt and selenium are most likely to be a problem in that late winter spring period, although selenium can also be deficient in summer and autumn. Uh, and then your vitamins, um, especially vitamin A uh, and vitamin E, which are essentially provided mostly in your green feed. If they've been on an extended dry diet, well, they can become lacking in that uh, summer autumn period. And vitamin D, of course, uh, is uh, provided primarily by sunlight. And in the southern half of Australia, we can actually have vitamin D deficiency, which in turn reduces the availability of calcium, uh, which is obviously important for a number of functions in the body. <laughs> 
So what role do the uh, trace elements in particular that we're talking about, so copper, zinc, uh, manganese and selenium are all really important trace elements uh, providing antioxidants. Now it's a term you might probably commonly hear about um, antioxidants, uh, uh, fighting free radicals, it's all a bit of a jargon, but um, antioxidants uh, are really the free radicals, um, which is the oxidative uh, parts in the body become more prevalent when we have a disease issue or when the animal's immune system is weakened, such as in that late pregnancy stage or during lactation, when there's a lot of effort going into the uh, fetal development and then and then lamb growth. And so um, in those vulnerable periods when the for the ewe and uh, for that matter, any female animal, um, as well as any disease process that might be causing um, the immune system to be compromised, uh, that's when the uh, uh, the antioxidants are really play an important role, uh, and these being these uh, trace elements here. So what signs do we see of mineral deficiency? So in the case of uh, lambs, or for that matter any young animal, uh, we have a lot of immunity which is influenced, uh, so primarily uh, copper, selenium, manganese and zinc play an important role in preventing um, lowered immunity. The same with anemia, copper and cobalt play an important role as does iron. Uh, in the case of poor growth, all these same trace elements play an important role in growth rate as well as some of your macro elements such as phosphorus and calcium. And then in the case of poor appetite, so the uh, if the animal is cobalt deficient, they develop a, a reduced appetite, which um, exacerbates the, um, the clinical signs that you see. Uh, and there are other elements here that all play so also have a role in maintaining good appetite. Uh, and poor appetite can develop into a depraved appetite. So a copper cobalt deficiency can result in the animals chewing bark off trees and uh, eating fence posts and, and those sort of behaviours. Uh, and also salt deficiency has a similar effect as does phosphorus. Uh, and then further down the track, uh, you can get bone, de bone deficiencies, uh, breakages, fractures, etc., cetera, um, associated with copper de deficiency, as well as uh, mang and zinc, uh, phosphorus and calcium. Uh, and then to finish off on here, just some of the impacts of trace elements on, on the adult. So we, once again, we can see poor conception, poor fertility, poor milk yield associated with any number of these trace and, and these macro elements. So there's a multitude of um, impacts of uh, trace elements and macro elements in terms of animal performance, growth rate uh, and disease immunity or resistance. Okay, so just focusing now on a few of the uh, specific uh, diseases. So selenium, for example, now this has a very much a coastal distribution and selenium tends to be more, well, we tend to generally say that um, because Australia's got old weathered soils that 90% of, of Australia is actually selenium deficient. And, uh, and so humans and animals are all generally relatively susceptible to selenium deficiency. Uh, and especially since the uh, selenium deficiency is more prone in your higher rainfall areas and especially those higher productive areas where there's more fertilizer used. So for example, high applications of phosphorus or sulfur or nitrogen all further reduce the availability of selenium. And then of course, um, the, the soils with significant iron content. So your red soils uh, also tend to have um, selenium deficiency. So these coastal areas and especially some of the higher rainfall areas is where we're more likely to see selenium deficiency show up. And also keeping in mind that uh, your high fertilizer application rates tend to encourage more legume development and legumes actually take up less selenium. So it's a bit of a, a double whammy. I might add here that um, these references are coming from the uh, Making More From Sheep. Hopefully many of you received that folder um, many moons ago, um, which has uh, all this in, in much more detail. So the signs that we see with selenium deficiency in young, I'll focus on the young stock, but I included adult stock here just uh, to, for completeness. But in young stock, uh, because we have uh, this um, impact on muscle function, and immune competence, uh, the deficiency shows up as stiff leggedness or lameness. Uh, you can get sudden death from uh, affecting the heart muscle. So where we get, uh, you tend to see clinically, you'll, if you post mortem animals that are selenium deficient, you'll see these pale streaks of muscle, uh, either in the um, skeletal muscles around the uh, joints uh, or otherwise even in the heart, heart muscle. So hence a sudden death can occur. 
So where we've got these pale streaks, we end up with what is why it's called white muscle disease. But you can even get a response, selenium response in animals that are not showing obvious uh, gross clinical signs. So this um, selenium response of unthriftiness where an animal may uh, be performing poorly, but not obviously selenium deficient. And the poor growth rates can go on uh, well into um, the hogget stage and beyond. Uh, and so generally adult animals are more able to cope with uh, mineral deficiency or have better reserves, whereas uh, trace elements are, are really severely impact some um, young animals. We can also see scouring and ill thrift, perhaps as much associated with the uh, that immune uh, loss of the immune strength of the animal, uh, reduced wool production, uh, and of course, uh, consequently increased susceptibility to disease. And this obviously flows over into um, various clinical signs also seen in adult animals. So stillbirths, premature calving, obviously more associated with cattle uh, and retained fetal membranes, but mastitis, uh, reduced wool production, reduced milk production can all obviously be a major, have a major bearing on sheep. So just a, a very quick case study here. This was a, a client I was dealing with many years ago where uh, he reported that he had about a seven lambs down out of a mob of 150 three-month-old merino lambs. They were bright and alert, but they just weren't able to walk. And uh, uh, when and you can see here where this lamb has been grazing quite closely in the um, crawling area, uh, but there's abundance of feedback here, which it really hasn't got to. So grazing lush pasture following uh, gypsum application and, and also um, irrigation. So gypsum being primarily calcium sulfate, so a really good source of sulfur, and for that matter, calcium. And uh, the consequence was that uh, the sulfur, high sulfur from a gypsum application actually impedes the uptake of uh, selenium. So in a pasture that normally uh, selenium deficiency wasn't an issue, the application of um, sulfur in the form of gypsum um, induced a deficiency. And so when these lambs, uh, we put a little rattle on their head, uh, and gave them a, a dose of selenium, and uh, next day um, they had recovered, apart from one that got attacked by the foxes before um, it recovered in time. So selenium uh, treatment or prevention, so you can have, and the uh, there's similar opportunities available for most of the trace elements we're dealing with. So uh, short-term strategies, uh, usually for um, you know, one to three months, so you can, provide selenium in the form of a mineral drench or a lick. The good part about selenium is you only need very trace amounts, effectively trillions, as opposed to parts per million. And uh, it is stored in the liver uh, and muscle uh, for up to two to three months. So one application, one drench, uh, can often provide sufficient selenium, at least for a two month period. Uh, older animals that last longer, younger animals that last a shorter time. And so when you buy vaccines with a selenium added in, usually that selenium does provide a benefit for probably at least six weeks. Uh, but then, but manufacturers are always careful not to put too much selenium in there because as, as I said earlier on, it can be toxic. And so if you're giving selenium by several different means, you can certainly tip a lamb over the edge. Um, they need about two milligram dose to meet their needs. And the adult dose is about five milligrams. But if so, if you give a lamb an adult dose of five milligrams, you'll probably kill the lamb. So you've got to be very careful giving selenium, especially if you're not a, if you're not sure if there's actually a deficiency there. Similarly, with a lot of the antihelminics, the worm drenches, uh, some of them, quite a few are sold. In fact, it's often you can't buy them without a selenium additive. Uh, but once again, it's a, usually a small amount, amount. So if the animals have got adequate selenium, the uh, bitch you'll get in the, um, the vaccine or drench won't be enough to cause a problem. Um, but you've got to be careful if you're giving, um, let's say, a selenium, say a selenate or a selenite drench, and then also giving them selenium in the vaccine or selenium in a worm drench, that uh, you could tip them over the edge. And then, of course, there are water medications. So, as I said, very small amounts of selenium required. Uh, and so the idea with the water was probably more of a water application rather than medication. Medication is probably not quite the right term. It implies that it sounds like you're giving them some sort of medicinal treatment. So a water application, usually these are only given every few weeks. And so a little bit of uh, selenium every few weeks is usually enough to tide them over. And then the long-term treatments, you can apply um, selenium chips, which is really just a, a bit of gravel with a bit of uh, selenium coating on it. 
and one as little as one kilogram per hectare per year is often enough to meet the needs in a uh, dry land situation or two kilograms of selenium chips added in with a fertilizer per hectare uh, on the irrigated area uh, and that may be well enough to meet the selenium needs. Now plants don't need selenium uh, but they will take it up and of course the animal gets access to it that way. Uh, you can also apply um, selenium as a foliar application and I have seen trial work now where one application of a foliar has provided 12 months benefit of selenium both in cattle and sheep uh, so that's another another option that you can actually look at so there are various uh, proprietary products that are able to provide that benefit and then the uh, last one here intraruminal bullets so or pellets so selenium pellets can provide one to three years uh, payout um, sometimes you may need to provide a grinder to prevent a calcium coat forming over the pellet so it does keep paying out and so here's a pelleting gun for example Okay, moving on to copper deficiency. So copper deficiency has a similar distribution in, in some respects to uh, selenium, but it's actually uh, quite the opposite in that um, copper deficiency tends to occur on your calcareous soils, the coastal sandy soils where you've got an excess of calcium. And so these are generally uh, alkaline soils. And uh, so the an excess of calcium tends to reduce the availability of copper. But as I said before, that there's a number of other minerals that also reduce the availability of copper. So you'll see copper deficiency showing up on acid soils as well. So especially through this volcanic or granitic soils here in uh, central western Victoria, uh, where you may have an excess of uh, molybdenum or iron or sulfur uh, or zinc or cadmium. Uh, and these can also reduce the availability of, of the copper so you may actually have sufficient copper in the soil but the excess of the other macro and trace elements um, renders it uh, insoluble or unavailable uh, when it goes into the rumen and so it goes out in the feces rather than being absorbed into the um, into the liver and uh, so a lot of these areas whilst they can be coastal calcareous sands uh, they may have other tie-ups which is uh, causing the copper deficiency so what do we see clinically with uh, copper deficiency? Uh, as I referred to earlier, uh, there's a number of enzymes that copper play a role in. There's about at least 12 enzymes in the body that copper is uh, very important for. So one is um, for keratinase. So the keratin on the uh, wool fiber uh, fails to develop properly. So you get this loss of crimp or steely wool where you don't actually have a, it's a lack of definition in the wool fiber. Uh, and so it tends to be uh, have a lower strength uh, and lacks luster, a dull appearance, loss of colour. So especially in black sheep, they tend to turn grey to off-white instead of being black uh, as a result of that deficiency. We also see that um, the uh, copper plays a role in uh, the lysyl oxidase, which forms the collagen in the bone structure and so lack of collagen means the bone tends to be very fragile and prone to fractures so this may show up as rib fractures or even fractures in the long bones so here's a photo that uh, Dave Rendell sent me some years ago from down south of Hamilton where um, these lambs were being yarded for the first time they're only sort of six to ten weeks of age and uh, we see here that they'd already had multiple rib fractures that were in the process of healing uh, but as these uh, lambs, there was about 40 odd out of uh, two or 300, uh, broke, had broken legs just in terms of uh, mustering and ready to bring into the yards. So spiral fractures of the tibia and femur uh, were quite common. And so that was a classic, um, when analyses were done, it was a classic copper deficiency uh, from that lack of collagen development um, through the lysyl oxidase. Uh, and consequently, um, you can have perhaps not clinical fractures as such, but certainly reduced growth rates as a result of that lack of copper. Uh, and this can also obviously be associated with the anemia. So animals that are anemic have uh, less oxygen in the blood, uh, and so are going to have poorer growth rates through poor oxygenation of the uh, of the muscle. Uh, we also see this condition of enzootic ataxia, or swayback as it's commonly called, uh, where the copper plays an important role in the um, myelin sheath around the spinal cord and the, and the um, various nerves. So the, um, the myelin sheath is really like the insulation around electrical wiring. Uh, and so if you have a copper deficiency, the uh, 
that electrical uh, insulation fails to develop in the latter stages of pregnancy. Uh, and so you'll tend to see this issue of staggers or ataxia as it's more correctly referred to or paralysis. And it often shows up in those first six weeks uh, following birth. Uh, it's more prevalent in springborn lambs, primarily because copper deficiency is more likely to show uh, developed during that early period after the autumn break through to midwinter. Uh, and so lambs that are born later in winter are most likely to be copper deficient uh, and have that copper deficiency apparent through the um, development as a fetus. Uh, and so they have this uh, sway back condition showing up. So we're seeing here that lambs that are somewhat, um, they can actually look like they've a bit like a praying mantis when they walk along. If they walk at all, they swagger around uh, or may not be able to walk at all. In fact, I think um, there's one syndrome we see in lambs called the mantis syndrome, which could well be associated with a copper deficiency. The uh, treatment, so similar to what we talked about with selenium, uh, we can see uh, either apply it as a fertilizer, usually about uh, 2% of copper sulfate, uh, in other words, two kilograms per 100 kilos of fertilizer um, per hectare, and uh, or as a foliar application, so copper as a foliar. Once again, copper is stored in the liver for a couple of months, and so one application can actually last for quite a significant period of time. However, uh, as I've already referred to, the fact that we do have this interaction with other nutrients, if you do a part tissue analysis and find your copper levels are above 10 parts per million, that's telling you that there's an adequate amount of copper in the diet, but if you've still got a deficiency problem, it's actually, it's obviously due to a secondary tie up with an excess of molybdenum, and copper, iron, sulfur, etc. cetera, sorry. Um, as an excess of uh, molybdenum, sulfur, iron, uh, zinc, calcium, uh, cadmium, etc. And so this is where a plant tissue analysis can be quite useful, but if it's, shows that you've actually got adequate copper in the diet, um, you've got to look at treating the animals directly. There's no point in applying it as a fertilizer or a foliar because it's just going to get tied up. Similar story with a mineral drench. Uh, firstly, um, it's often poorly absorbed, especially if it's a copper sulfate drench. Uh, and uh, I have heard um, organic farmers tell me that if you give them one gram of copper, uh, it works well. If you give them two grams, it kills them. And uh, even, even though it's poorly absorbed, um, you don't, can't afford to overdose with copper. Uh, but once again, the drench is only going to be effective if it's a primary copper deficiency. In other words, there's a lack of copper in the diet. If um, you've got other elements impeding the availability, well then drenching is, is going to cause the same issue. And generally with a drench, as I say, it's stored in the liver for sort of six to eight weeks. Uh, and so if you do, if it's a primary deficiency, you'll probably need to drench every couple of months. The alternatives, once again, blocks and licks, uh, water applications. Um, as I said, these are usually done every sort of six weeks uh, or an injectable form. Uh, Multi-min is the only available injectable copper uh, in sheep in Australia or registered in sheep in Australia. Uh, and that has a payout for about six weeks, uh, similar to these other treatments. Whereas the uh, copper capsules, which is a uh, copper oxide needles, and so this illustration shows here that um, you put the uh, copper capsule or bullet down the um, esophagus, down the throat, uh, lodges in the, um, or it's a gelatin capsule, which dissolves pretty soon after uh, intake. And the uh, copper oxide pellets fall out, settle out in the bottom of the rumen and the upper stomachs. And they slowly um, oxidize and pass, pass through into the, um, the fourth stomach and in the small intestine where the acid environment uh, dissolves them, making the copper available. And they're designed in such a way, specific gravity, that um, those um, little copper oxide particles will persist in the body for eight to 12 months and so have this continuous play out. Now, I know these gelatin capsules uh, haven't been available in recent times due to manufacturing issues, as we're seeing with a lot of other products, um, but I'm assuming they will be back on the market, if not already. Uh, the final um, trace element I was going to talk about here was uh, with cobalt. So once again, taken from the um, making more from sheep uh, manual. And so we see here that the distribution of cobalt efficiency is not quite as, a, as severe as with the uh, selenium and copper. 
but it's a similar distribution in that it's a coastal areas and once again similar to copper mainly associated with calcareous soils so where you've got significant amount of limestone or pre-calcium available and uh, so the cobalt becomes tied up and unavailable to the animal so even though it may be um, inadequate levels in the soil um, it's not rendered available to the animal so what do we see with cobalt efficiency so similar to copper uh, we can have uh, poor red blood cell development so resulting in anemia uh, and consequently uh, a poor appetite and poor growth rate so cobalt plays a significant role in the um, energy cycle in the body so the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle uh, and propionic acid is the main form of um, uh, energy provided in starches and uh, and sugars in the diet which is directly converted into glucose in the body so without cobalt in the diet um, that um, probionic fails to be converted into uh, glucose so the anim animal actually runs out of energy uh, and uh, as a result of that um, lack of appetite develops and consequently poor growth rates uh, and other consequences are diarrhea we may also see uh, once again through that lack of glucose um, passing through to the brain uh, we can have an apparent blindness and convulsive uh, behavior we can also have this uh, what we call white liver disease uh, which then leads on to a secondary signs which uh, have often been associated with cobalt deficiency and that is uh, we get photosensitization where we get this uh, of hardening or leather look around the face and any bare areas tend to uh, get sunburned especially in your late uh, winter early spring period where you're getting a bit more sunlight interacting with the skin so we get this uh, skin peeling off um, the bare areas and uh, we often and that includes uh, these sort of scaly ears developing so the scaly ears which has always been associated with cobalt deficiency or vitamin b12 deficiency uh, is actually a uh, a result of this white liver disease as a consequence of uh, the lack of cobalt in the diet. We can also see um, these reamy eyes or an ocular discharge that looks a bit like a you know, the tear staining in poodles uh, and uh, so this this lamb here has primarily got a um, cobalt deficiency uh, and it's got the secondary impact of uh, photosensitization as a result of the um, cobalt deficiency and we're also seeing this tear staining or the reamy eye. Uh, and a further consequence is reduced re disease resistance to um, so if parasites are available uh, they can easily build up and cause further problems or any other disease uh, agent so for example you might be more likely to see uh, uh, pneumonia developing uh, mastitis etc <clears throat> so ill thrift lethargy uh, and if it's treated can easily lead to death uh, and then the adult animal reduced milk production so that uh, can further exacerbate the problems in young lambs uh, and then lower fertility which means that um, perhaps the ewes don't even get in lamb how can we treat uh, cobalt efficiency so once again um, drenching but unlike copper and selenium which can be stored in the body for six to eight weeks uh, cobalt's not stored in the body uh, and so a drench will only have a week a benefit of about one week <clears throat> now what I haven't explained here is that cobalt is converted into vitamin b12 uh, in the rumen and uh, so cyanocobalamin as we call it technically but so b12 uh, is the effect of uh, copper uh, sorry cobalt being in the diet uh, becomes an active b12 agent in the body uh, and so that's really has a has a has an impact so when we talk about cobalt or b12 deficiency we're talking about one and the same thing it's just cobalt is the mineral in the diet and b12 is the active agent that it's converted into in, uh, in the body so we can once again uh, water applications every um you know four to six weeks can be an effective supplementation uh, injections so the b12 injection usually lasts for about six weeks we did actually have a long acting injection in Australia available for a few years, but it wasn't used sufficiently that the manufacturer withdrew its um, sale in Australia, but it is still available in, in New Zealand. Uh, that used to last for more like six months, uh, obviously a fair bit more expensive. 
we have cobalt ports, once again, can last for one to three years. But once again, we also need to look at perhaps providing a grinder to prevent a calcium coating, especially because we have cobalt deficiency and for that matter, copper deficiency in calcareous soils where we've got an excess of calcium. A calcium carbonate coat often fills on, uh, surrounds the bullet and reduces the uh, mineral availability. So by putting a grinder in with it, or perhaps two bullets together, uh, you can prevent that copper carbonate, sorry, calcium carbonate or limestone coating developing on the bullet. Uh, we can also use foliar sprays, uh, misting. Uh, and so this, uh, there's a, an extra benefit here that if you're on phalaris pastures, and especially the older varieties of phalaris, we can get this phalaris staggers problem, which often develops about this time of the year when you've had enough moisture around to get um, new shoots from the, uh, the perennial phalaris plants. And uh, they often have a, a, a toxin in those new shoots, which um, strangely enough, uh, cobalt in the rumen uh, tends to encourage microbial breakdown of those toxins before they get absorbed. And so you only need to be applying a 50 grams, in other words, you know, a couple of dessert spoonfuls of cobalt, uh, sorry, yeah, cobalt sulfate per hectare uh, to prevent that problem. Or we normally say uh, two bullets uh, to prevent that um, toxin being absorbed and causing the staggers. Uh, but it doesn't treat the sudden death. So phalaris can also cause sudden death, which is a, is a different syndrome. And uh, so cobalt can also equally be applied as a fertiliser. Um, you know, it's usually some, something like ten to $15,000 a tonne, so you don't actually apply too much, but um, it's another way you can apply it. Uh, also in uh, blocks and licks. So summarising, uh, really uh, dealing with trace elements, um, there are a lot of other issues that may be causing ill thrift in lambs uh, or poor growth rate. Uh, and so really it, it does require a significant amount of monitoring. And one of the problems is that uh, we get such seasonal variation uh, where we can have feast and famine as we well know. Um, and uh, so in the wet years, we're more likely to see these trace element and for that matter macro element deficiencies show up. Whereas in your drought years or dry years, uh, those minerals are, are generally more available, perhaps more bioavailable. Uh, and the fact is part of it's because we've got less plant tissue um, and so we've generally got a bit more mineral available in the less plant tissue. So it's the wet years. Um, it's also wet years also encourage more competition from some of the other elements. So in, for example in the case of uh, copper, um, molybdenum is highly mobile and available, copper not so much and so um, in a wet year there'll be lots of mo um, molybdenum available. Uh, whereas the copper and further restricting the availability of any copper. So by using um, soil analysis, we can look at the nutrient reservoir. Now it's not all that accurate for looking at trace elements, because as we say, trace elements are only required in parts per million. And when you think about when you do a soil analysis, you might take um, you know, the equivalent of a bucket full of soil as you go across a paddock. Uh, but usually what you send to the lab is only about 200 grams. Uh, and so if you think of um, trace elements only being required in parts per million, the dilution effect of doing a soil analysis means that um, trace element um, accuracy can be lost. Whereas in a pasture analysis, um, there's more, uh, it's a more accurate method. And so you can actually get a pretty good prediction of what uh, macro and trace elements are available through a plant tissue analysis. But one of the problems is all the com competing nutrients um, makes a prediction of trace element efficiency from a pasture alone can be a, a bit more complicated. Of course, we can also do feed analyses, uh, which is primarily we're looking at energy and protein, which as I said earlier on, is perhaps the most important nutrients of all in terms of affecting animal performance. Uh, we can do water tests to see what the nutrient availability is. Normally we're looking for toxicities there as opposed to um, sufficient levels for supplementation. Uh, and then we can look at various body samples be it blood, liver, urine, milk or faeces, uh, can all provide useful tests for looking at um, mineral sufficiency in the animal. Uh, and of course, this is perhaps the ultimate test in that we're actually looking at what the animal has consumed as opposed to what predicting what it may consume. Uh, and the liver, generally the liver biopsy, uh, so taking a little pinch of liver out of the live animal um, with a biopsy instrument is the most accurate. 
but um, in the latter stages of winter and spring, a blood test uh, generally can be quite reliable as well. And of course, not overlooking um, the graziers' observations. So having a keen eye for what um, may appear as a deficiency and, and dealing with it, but um, essentially monitoring uh, is really the stitch in time to save nine. Whereas observation, as I said earlier on, you can already have 20% loss of productivity uh, before it will become overtly obvious. In other words, clinical science developing. Uh, on that point, Peter, I think I might um, finish up and see if there's any questions. If you are there, Peter. Lost him. Perhaps I finished up too soon. Uh, okay, Peter, are you available? I can't even ask people to um, fire questions to me because I don't have access to that. I might have to see if Peter's available uh, per phone. I can't hear you at all. <laughs> so I wasn't hearing Peter. I'm not sure if anyone else was out in there in the webinar land, but um, he must be having himself heard, or certainly from my end. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now, Colin? I can hear you, yes. All right, apologies. Uh, so thank you again, Colin, for that very thorough uh, presentation. Uh, always mm -hmm. informative. Uh, before we get into questions, guys, just as a, 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 I'll mention again, our next webinar is on resolving conflict. Again, uh, we're looking at some you know day-to-day -day skills required to to run the farm operation. Uh, the other thing that I'll, I'll raise again is please complete the survey on the exit. It's two minutes and uh, of your time and provides us valuable feedback to change these events uh, to suit producers. Uh, final point before we get into questions is there are other resources available. Um, so I'll direct you to the MLA resources there and different courses available. And uh, if you missed anything from tonight's webinar, all webinars are recorded and available within two to three days of, uh, of the event. And the link is available down there. So I'll put that up. I'll leave that up as we get into our questions, Colin. So to kick us off. Uh, a nice simple one. How long uh, does multi-min persist for in the bloodstream? Yep. yep. So multi-min uh, is limited by the, um, I guess, the most limiting nutrient, which probably tends to be uh, cobalt. Um, and so, whereas uh, the selenium uh, and copper uh, and the other minerals that it also and vitamins that matter that it um, contains would normally last you can expect at least six weeks payout, six to eight weeks. Uh, and so generally, um, and whilst um, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to give it a jab every six weeks, um, it means that you're actually getting at least a six week benefit. Uh, and so you might actually space the uh, treatments out according to other, other times when you're handling the animals. Uh, but as I say, you're not going to have, most areas don't have trace or for that matter macro element deficiencies all year round. It tends to be more associated with particular pasture types, uh, soil types, etc. And so you may only need to give these supplements um, during that sort of winter period. So that's where um, sampling you know, liver or blood uh, and to a lesser extent pasture can give you some idea of your susceptibility to deficiencies over a 12 month period. And for that matter, over sequential years, depending on, uh, on your climatic conditions. Okay, thanks. Uh, now, uh, your view on the use of seaweed meal as part of a complete mineral supplement, fed year round on acid soils. Any experience there or thoughts, Colin? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, actually a colleague and I have just done a, um, a water medication with seaweed uh, trial where we certainly saw an advantage over, over and above a treated group um, with the um, trace element uh, supplementation via water medication or water application. So uh, seaweed, whether it's in a, um, a powdered form uh, mixed into a, a ration or whether it's in a water, medic, water treatment form, uh, certainly can provide um, sufficient nutrient to get a, um, a growth response. But once again, I do add that um, it probably it depends on the individual circumstances. So I can't say um, you know, like a blanket or carte blanche statement that um, it works in all circumstances. Uh, and the other thing is that um, you know a lot of the time when we're doing these trials, we're only measure, measuring one or two or three nutrients. Uh, whereas um, I mean, as the um, the analysis indicates with seaweed, you know, there's something like 70 different um, macro and trace elements and hormones and uh, and enzymes. Uh, and, and then you can have um, you know, additional amino acids, et cetera, added in. So it's really hard to quantify the benefit um, uh, in, in one trial and say, you know, this applies to all situations. So I do see merit in um, using seaweed applications. So whether you're providing it as a loose lick um, where animals can help themselves or whether you're putting it in the water trough, um, you know, I think there is merit in it for sure but um, I can't say categorically that it's going to work in all situations. Uh, thanks, Colin. Now, is it more efficient to feed minerals to stock or try and correct the soil deficiency? It's a pretty general question. Yeah. Um, Colin, so we'll keep it generic. And look, yeah, and look, that, um, that comes back to, uh, as I've said, one of the problems with minerals is um, it's not, it's not um, straightforward in that because you have a lot of competing minerals uh, sometimes uh, for example I know uh, sort of looking at research here in South Australia uh, when they first looked into um, copper and cobalt efficiency in the southeast uh, down the robe, robe area where we used to what was recognized in the 30s and 40s that you take lambs or or weaners or calves across to the coast and they'd die within a few um, weeks or months of uh, being moved over there and that was called coastal disease because they didn't know what it was the uh, CSRO did their research in the 40s and 50s and worked out it was cobalt and copper deficiency. Uh, and when they applied the uh, copper sulfate as a fertilizer, uh, we they found that you've got actually over 20 years of benefit from one application, uh, which was miraculous. I mean, all of a sudden you can grow a, a whole lot of uh, legumes, pastures, clovers, etc. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful find. But then, um, as they appreciated, you need to provide extra uh, cobalt and molybdenum to encourage root nodulation for nitrogen fixation in the um, in the the legumes, and as a result of that, the uh, molybdenum accumulated in the soil, and that made the copper no longer available. And so then they found that uh, copper application, uh, copper sulfate, uh, only lasted for a year or so because the um, molly was tying it up. Uh, and so that's one classic example where. Um, if you've got a straightforward soil with no other comp competing elements, um, soil application is certainly the best way to go because you're getting a benefit in terms of soil fertility improving plant growth, the plant growth improving, uh, and so you're getting better animal response. But, um, yeah, one of the problems is that um, there's so many other competing nutrients now that uh, we've actually made it more complex or induced more deficiencies as, re as a result of our um, fertilizer applications uh, into excess in some areas. Uh, and so it's not easy, it's not uh, predictable to say that a, a soil application is the best way to go or depend entirely on the particular paddock or circumstance and the fertilizer history, the soil type, the, the um, seasonal conditions, etc. Uh, and that's why I, my last slide there talking about, um, you know, we really need to look at um, regular nutrient monitoring uh, to work out uh, what the pro possibilities or most of the cost effective way of um, treating or preventing deficiencies occurring. Yeah, a great answer to an impossible question, I think, there, Colin. Um, now, I'm going to paraphrase this question. Uh, it's not really clear, um, but. I think the uh, uh, question relates to, given um, the recent seasonal conditions where we haven't necessarily seen plant maturity um, 
you know, or, or drying off in summer, have we seen any difference in mineral um, availability or challenges there? Uh, yeah, that is an interesting one. I think, uh, as I say, primarily it comes back to root development. So if you've actually got a plant that's got a well-established root system, and so that's I mean, easy easy to test. You just go out and, and dig up a plant or two, you know, whether it's lucerne or clover or or phalaris or whatever. And if you've got a well-developed root system, there's a fair chance the um, the mineral, if there's a mineral available in the soil, that plant should have had access to it. And so a more mature plant will always have a, a better nutrient level, but of course it depends on the soil in which it's growing and the um, fertiliser history, et cetera, as to whether that's got adequate amounts of um, whatever trace element you might be looking at or macro element. Um, and if that plant remains green for longer, um, that generally means you're going to have a, a, a pretty, generally a, a good mineral availability. As the plants high off uh, and, and die, um, it's interesting that the uh, bioavailability of the minerals become uh, improves. And so in the dead plant, even though especially in perennial species where as the plant haze off and dies, the, um, it actually retracts or resorbs mineral back into its root system ready for the um, new seasonal growth the next time we have a season break. And, uh, and so whereas in annual species, basically um, the plant um, sort of withers and dies and, uh, and the minerals are lost. But uh, the mineral that is remaining in those um, dead plants is actually more available. So it's better absorbed by the animal. And as I said earlier, uh, during that um, dead pastures phase, um, animals tend to be eating more soil. And so they're getting their mineral supplementation directly from the soil anyway, and almost bypassing the plant. Uh, so that tends to be uh, the reason why we see most of the deficiencies occurring in your winter period, uh, because one is they're not eating soil, uh, and two, uh, the poor root development means the plant is often lacking in your trace elements, and often has an excess of phosphorus, sulphur, nitrogen, uh, potassium, which all impede the uptake of um, calcium, magnesium, copper, cobalt, selenium, etc. Uh, and so, yeah, it really depends very much on circumstance as to what deficiencies are likely to show up. Uh, in different seasonal conditions. Okay, uh, a couple of nice easy ones, Colin. Uh, should we have salt available for lambs or, or sheep all year round? Uh, look, generally I would say yes, but it does depend. If you've got, uh, for example, uh, saline water supplies, you probably find the animals are getting an adequate amount of salt anyway. Uh, salt is certainly an important um, uh, element for sheep production. Uh, sheep actually require quite a bit more than what cattle do. Uh, and it's also a bit of an appetite stimulant, uh, just the same as when we eat potato chips, uh, it drives you to want to eat more because of the salt content. Well, it's the same with uh, livestock and uh, and salt does play an important role in the uh, water balance in animals uh, as it does in people. Uh, and so there's no doubt salt is a, is a vital element in the diet. Uh, but uh, it would depend on circumstance. If you've got an adequate amount of sodium uh, in the either in the water supply or in the soil, you probably don't need to provide a supplement. But if you are trying to get animals to consume additional minerals, um, mixing a bit of salt in is certainly one way to stimulate the appetite. Uh, and so commonly when we're trying to provide, for example, calcium and or magnesium to use during the pregnancy phase, uh, mixing in a bit of salt certainly improves the uptake. Although animals often will um, go and gobble up um, lime that's been put in the paddock anyway because they uh, they do uh, sense a need for that supplement anyway. Okay. Um, how common is potassium deficiency as an issue um, in Pistachia with lambing? Or at lambing? Uh, now this, this is one that's always a, a bit prone to congestion, but certainly from my understanding and experience, uh, calcium is really uh, critical uh, and I would like to see it uh, available to animals all year round. Now having said that, once again, if you've got a well-developed um, uh, plant root system, they've usually taken up enough calcium, magnesium by spring, and uh, and so the animals should be getting an adequate intake uh, from, from that spring feed. Uh, and so ewes that have um, basically had a lamb, had lactation through that autumn winter period, or even into spring, once the lambs are weaned, they've got a couple months window to re-establish their normal calcium reserves in their bones. Uh, given that um, the, the bones actually act as a 70% of the calcium that 
uh, made available to lambs during late pregnancy and lactation is really coming from the bones. And so you really need those used to re-establish their bone calcium reserves in the um, post weaning period. And so providing, uh, and, and generally if, um, if the feed is a good quality feed through spring, they should enable, that should be enabled. Now, one of the problems we're seeing with a lot of uh, confinement or containment feeding these days where ewes are being locked up in that um, pre-lambing phase for perhaps two or three months uh, while pastures get established, it does appear that year in, year out, they may not be re-establishing their calcium levels. And, uh, and so this may be why we're seeing a significant amount of ewe deaths in containment or confinement. Uh, and so that's one of the theories that we're looking at currently. But um, yeah, look at calcium, I think, um, there are so many different circumstances where calcium deficiency develops. It can be a lack of a dry feed during pregnancy. It can be a provision of lush, too much lush feed during pregnancy. It can be um, provision of um, a grain diet during pregnancy. They all predispose to a calcium deficiency. So even though we're relying on the, uh, the bones to provide calcium uh, for the uh, developing fetuses uh, in the uterus, or, or for that matter, the calcium in the milk during lactation. Um, I personally think that um, you know, just about in all situations, a calcium supplement should be provided through pregnancy. But I would hope uh, that in most circumstances, and it, once again, it depends on soil type, that there should be enough calcium in the diet during that uh, post weaning phase to meet the used needs. All right, uh, Colin, we've got a few, few more questions. So guys, I'll, I'll have to pull, pull us up on any further questions. Um, Colin, we might try and move through these ones a, a bit quicker. Um, now, same question as before, but in relation to potassium deficiency, can you comment, please? Uh, so, potassium uh, actually goes hand in hand with sodium in terms of it's a, a very vital to a normal fluid balance in the body, uh, and it's pro probably more important for um, plant growth because it um, primarily uh, develops the uh, cell size and so the plant growth. Um, the deficiency, uh, as I say, could impact on mineral or sort of say water balance in the animal, but it's generally not a big issue. Um, uh, potash or potassium deficiency tends to be more an impact on, on pasture or plant growth. Um, so I think it's the excess potassium in the diet which uh, reduces the availability of calcium and magnesium, which is the bigger problem, uh, rather than a deficiency as such. But certainly potassium is it plays an important role in in plant development. So um, yeah, we do need adequate amount of potassium in the diet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, in what form of selenium is the quickest uh, has the quickest absorption? I.e. Uh, selenium takes 12 weeks to get sufficient levels up available. What can we use for quicker uptake? Uh, yeah, well, basically most of the selenium is either provided as a uh, selenite or a selenate uh, salt or form. Um, and the selenate is, uh, I might be, I might have this wrong way around, but generally the selenate, uh, selenium selenate is much more available than the selenite. Um, but uh, look, either work quite well. And as I say, because you only need very small parts. Um, you know, it's, uh, for example, in, if you do a plant analysis, you only need 0.05 parts per million of selenium in the plant to meet animal's needs. Uh, and fortunately, the only thing that really competes with uh, selenium availability is sulfur. So if there's an excess of sulfur in the diet, um, it increases the need for more selenium. But um, yeah, there is also, um, uh, some selenium chelates or organic forms of selenium uh, but generally because there's only small amounts required and even though it can be quite poorly absorbed or poor, uh, poorly bioavailable um, generally I'd say all forms are quite probably going to provide adequate amount of selenium. Okay um, now in relation to co copper toxicity um, We've got a scenario here where uh, a producer's got too much uh, moly in the soil and plants. Um, yes. They're concerned about copper deficiency, but hearing your comments about copper toxicity, it makes them nervous over doing it. How easy can that happen? Uh, they're finding it difficult to get the levels up. 
Yeah, uh, and that's probably where, yeah, and, and unfortunately there's not many options with copper. Uh, so for example, we did talk about uh, Multimin, which is an injectable copper, which um, uh, that's really only become available to sheep in the last year or so. Um, so that's the, probably the only sure way of getting copper into the animal uh, and uh, and bypassing any interactions with molybdenum or, or other elements. Um, but it does seem that even in the presence of an excess of molybdenum, uh, I think if you're providing a little bit of copper often, um, some of it must obviously be getting through. So, you know, for example, an ad lib access such as, um, you know, your, your seaweed products or your uh, mineral licks um, and perhaps foliar applications, those sort of things where you're probably um, swamping the body with, with copper. Uh, it is poorly absorbed. Um, as I said, copper sulfate, for example, is only about 1% of what you apply um, is actually made available for the animal. So the bioavailability is quite limited. And so that also tends to reduce the risk of copper toxicity. But um, I think in that situation where you have got an excess of molybdenum, the sure way of avoiding it is um, with an injectable copper, uh, and that's multimin. Uh, as I say, that only really lasts for about six weeks in, in young animals. Um, alternatively, uh, probably just providing a bit of copper in as an ad lib. Um, you don't tend to get enough absorption to cause toxicity. It's more a problem if you're actually overdosing with an injectable form uh, or and even the uh, copper bolus or the copper capsule because it's a trickle out. It's really, uh, I guess that's the other way of getting around the problem is that um, because the copper gelatin capsule lasts for eight to 12 months, it's a slow amount of copper being released into the system all the time. And so that probably that overcomes this interaction with the molybdenum um, causing an insoluble content, uh, a complex. Okay, Colin, you made mention of um, pasture analysis. Um, can you give us some mm -hmm. more options for, for laboratories in Southeast Australia? Uh, look, there's a, a lot of different laboratories uh, will do plant tissue analysis. Um, some will give you more detail than others, but they'll all have copper in it. Um, it's just some labs don't do selenium routinely. Uh, and so that's something I would check with the laboratory. Some actually charge a significant additional fee for selenium, whereas others uh, with a mass spectrometer will do will provide selenium results. Um, yeah, as inclusive as part of it, you know, it normally costs around about seven or eighty dollars, or perhaps eighty or ninety dollars for plant tissue analysis. Uh, and I would make sure that they're providing uh, selenium, uh, the copper and cobalt they would normally provide anyway. Uh, but in the case of selenium, they also need to provide sufficient accuracy. So it's got to be down to at least uh, you know, 0.03 parts per million. Some will just uh, provide a result down to about one part per million, which is useless because you don't see the deficiency develop unless it's below 0.05 parts per million. Um, and so there's a number of labs will provide that. So I don't want to single out any particular lab, um, yeah. but um, yeah, uh, it's a matter of checking with the lab to see what sort of um, uh, results they'll provide. But though we will all generally provide at least 16 elements. Um, but if you're interested in selenium, you've got to, it might, you've got to check that. Yeah. Um... So from an animal health perspective, is multi-min injections at marking and weaning a safety net, a safety net to address all potential deficiencies? Um, the question, uh, the person who asked this question understands it might not be economically viable to do this, but from a best practice animal husbandry's perspective, would you recommend that? Uh, yeah, look, if um, once again, if you know your deficiencies, um, you know specifically what you need to be treating with. I guess multi-min tends to be a bit of a shotgun therapy, uh, treating obviously there's about a half a dozen different components in multi-min. Um, so it, yeah, look, it is quite an effective um, multiple therapy uh, if you've got multiple deficiencies. But uh, I, I think before I give an injectable form, because it is you know, potentially more absorbable or more bioavailable because of its um, the nature of which how it's been developed. Uh, it could also, you know, you don't want to be providing extra copper and selenium if the animal doesn't need it. So that's where I really would be looking at probably doing a liver or or, or blood test uh, during that susceptible period, the late winter spring period, to see if they really needed. 
Uh, and one of the other probably small side effects with injectables is they, they do tend to cause a bit of um, muscle damage. Uh, and so you don't want to be giving an injection to uh, lambs you know, shortly before they're going off to slaughter. Otherwise, you may find you're getting um, a bit of extra uh, trimming going on. So, um, yeah, you've just got to be a bit careful when you're giving injections that you, you give it at least six to eight weeks prior to um, the animals being slaughtered. Okay. Um, now, in relation to copper um, sulfate going out, uh, or copper going out with super, you, you quoted two kilos per 100 grams, uh, 100 kilos of super. Is that product mm -hmm. sulfate um, or elemental rates? Yeah, look, that was, that was a copper sulfate. I mean, that was just, that's probably just a routine um, recommendation that's been around for decades. Um, so yeah, two kilograms per hundred is uh, 2%. So normally um, when you look at a, a fertilizer analysis, um, most of these trace elements are only included at around about the you know, you know, one to 5% level. Generally, um, you know, if you're talking 5% inclusion of anything, whether it's manganese or, or whatever, um, it gets pretty expensive. And so, um, yeah, a standard rate for copper is uh, two percent copper sulfate. Okay. So, bearing in mind that copper sulfate is actually only about twenty or twenty-three percent copper, so um, yeah, you're not putting a lot out there. All right. Um, now, uh, could you quickly? We covered this off in the first webinar. Just um, step through liver sampling for analysis. How how people go about it or get trained to do that. Yeah, so that's is probably. Uh, look, I know um, it, it's generally a, a veterinary procedure. Uh, in sheep, it's a, a bit more. You've got to be a bit more careful than in cattle because you're a smaller target. And uh, so, what you're basically putting in a little um, a liver biopsy instrument, which is about um, like the, half the diameter of a biro, and uh, you're you're basically just putting a bleb of local anaesthetic in the skin. Uh, pushing this little uh, biopsy instrument through the, the rib cage. Uh, and if you follow the directions correctly, you'll end up spearing the liver. Uh, and of course, if you go too deep, you can actually um, puncture the hepatic artery and cause the animal to bleed to death in a few minutes. So that's why it's, it's a bit of a refined procedure. It's not something that um, I've been encouraging producers to do themselves, um, even though you can find the technique um, on the, uh, like everything else on YouTube these days. Um, but yeah, generally uh, you'd be, especially these days, considering animal welfare issues, you're probably using a bit of um, uh, sedative, uh, a local anaesthetic to do it, but also um, some anti-inflammatory painkiller, you know, for, for example, your meloxicam that you would normally use for tail docking and uh, musing and those sort of procedures. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, it's a really, it's a, it's a technique which um, is simple enough if you do, like most things, if you do it often, uh, but it's not something that you would, uh, I'd recommend anyone to do unless they've had experience. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, in lambs, is there a significant interaction with parasite-induced scouring and trace mineral deficiencies? Uh, for sure. Uh, yep. So, because uh, you know, particularly the, the trace elements I referred to are so uh, influential on the immune competence or the animal's ability to resist disease. Uh, if they're down in trace elements, you're more likely to get um, a scouring developing, um, with, especially with cobalt and selenium, not so much with copper. Interestingly enough, copper deficiency in cattle shows up as scouring, but not so much in sheep. But you do get secondary scouring as a result of, you know, perhaps the parasite or worm burden builds up as a result of the lack of immunity. Uh, and so you, the worms might essentially be causing the scouring, but it may be an underlying copper deficiency, which has enabled the worms to get established. So um, there's no doubt uh, any animal with scouring, uh, especially lambs, uh, you always suspect worms first, but it could well be um, a secondary uh, a trace element deficiency. And of course, in adult sheep, um, you might be also thinking of things like Yoni's disease and uh, those sort of issues. Okay, last two questions. Thanks, Colin. Um, with mineral interrelationships, if you're treating cereal grain with calcium uh, during supplement feeding, and then you also give a calcium-based mineral lead during lambing, could you be having a detrimental effect by tying up mag mang manganese, magnesium, iron, or zinc? Uh, yeah, look, there is that potential. Um, 
Now, bearing in mind that grain generally has about six times more phosphorus than calcium, uh, and so we normally we like to say we want a two to one ratio of calcium to phosphorus, but grain, cereal grains generally have a one to six ratio of calcium to phosphorus. And, uh, and so that's why we always say if you're feeding, you know, if more than 50% of the diet is, is grain based um, and you're providing it for more than four to four to six weeks uh, continuous, uh, always a good idea to provide extra calcium. Um, but uh, look, calcium is actually very poorly absorbed like copper. Uh, interestingly enough, you need about five or 10 grams of actual calcium uh, per day in the uh, pregnant lactating ewe. Uh, and they're probably only absorbing around about, um, I think it's something like two to 10% of the calcium you're providing. So the risk of tying up other nutrients is pretty limited. Um, and uh, I mean, the other major concern is that um, you know, everybody relates it back to dairy cattle, where if you're providing a calcium supplement in late pregnancy, it's suppressing the uptake of calcium from the bone. Uh, and so when you go into lactation, um, the animal falls over with a deficiency because it's um, the bones aren't providing calcium. Um, whereas we always say sheep aren't small cows. Um, sheep actually do need a significant amount of calcium in their diet at all stages uh, through pregnancy and lactation. And uh, so, yeah, the risk of, I know calcium does tie up other nutrients, um, you know, your, your zinc, um, phosphorus, et cetera. Um, but I think um, you probably, the animal's not absorbing enough to really have that tie up problem uh, when, when there's such a demand. Because the other issue is the, the homeostasis or the, the mineral balancing system in the body um, uh, can turn on and turn off both the uptake from the diet and also the retention in the in the body. So if the animal is um, calcium deficient, it actually switches on more receptors in the gut to get better absorption of calcium. Um, but if it's actually getting sufficient calcium in the diet, it actually um, it shuts down the uh, absorption. So there is a very complex mechanism which uh, ensures that there's enough calcium being absorbed, providing it's available in the diet. So the biggest risk is not having enough in the diet rather than um, having an oversupply. Right. And, and, and because you're only providing calcium for a relatively short term in the year, um, you know, really through pregnancy lactation, um, if there are you know, a bit of a zinc deficiency or whatever developing, it should recover once you, um, the calcium is taken out of the supplement. All right. Last question now, Colin. Um, now, why don't we see much mineral deficiency during the spring period? Um, particularly in areas with tropical perennial pastures emerging or annual natives at this time? Yeah, look, I, th I think part of it is um, bioavailability. Uh, part of it's also the root system development. Uh, and the other thing which I really haven't covered here, I've been sort of talking more about um, almost, I'm assuming almost mono monocultures in, in a lot of the grazing that we have in place. So if we, uh, for example, you never see mineral deficiencies in pastoral areas or in uh, pastures which have multiple species. So for example, they say the ideal diet for, a, for any livestock should be about 200 different plant species in a pasture. Uh, and native pastures generally have that or areas that haven't been uh, disturbed by agricultural practices and, uh, and sowing monocultures or, or you know, three or four different plant mixes. So uh, I think it depends a lot on the environment that um, if you've got a multiple for a, a big range of species available. Um, animals are, are very resourceful in terms of getting a mineral, minerally balanced or adequate diet. Um, the biggest problem I think we have, especially in, uh, in perhaps your higher rainfall areas where you tend to have a perhaps two to five perennial species in a pasture mix, that um, you just don't have that biodiversity to ensure that um, the animals are accessing a, a minerally balanced diet. Uh, and so that's where grazing management plays an important role and also the uh, the way we manage our pastures in terms of uh, what species we put in. But look, sometimes the best grazing can be your native pastures um, uh, and so be that tropical, subtropical or, or arid land. Um, if you, It's the biodiversity which ensures that animals uh, can actually browse a sufficient variety of plants to uh, get an adequate mineral intake. Okay, well, thank you very much, Colin, for all that uh, detail there, your wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate your insights tonight. Uh, thank you to everyone for tuning in, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in a fortnight's time. Good night.
Thank you. Cheers.